The Macmillan estate was once the envy of even the most well-pampered families. Now it's only an ominous lot with nothing more than horrid memories of mercilessness in its purest form. The foundry and mine were the heart and centre of the estate. Those unlucky enough to be employed by Evan Macmillan after he assumed his father's work slowly started to slip away from all kinds of normal life. Work hours got longer, sometimes bridging day to day and pay was ever decreasing. Evan's iron hand and strict rules got tighter the longer he was in control. One afternoon a large mining force was forbidden to leave and instructed to meet inside one of the deepest and unstable mine shafts instead. Objections were rewarded with a visit to the furnace. Questions and rumours arose in town, but no answers. One less worker missed maybe by a poor widow wasn't enough for real actions. Finally, Evan McMillan had snapped and had sealed his workers in the mine, suffocating those who weren't crushed by the initial blast of the explosives. Archie McMillan's starved remains were later found, a silent skeleton with a taunting man-made grin upon its meatless skull. What's left of the estate are now but mere ruins and myths. Teens enter the area from time to time in a game of dare, bringing back new information about what's happening at the estate, because somehow things are moving. Leftover machinery keeps starting up, the gas gauge on the generator keeps decreasing. Colden Farm was widely known as it spanned two counties. Mr and Mrs Adams put a lot of work into the farm, but all those blisters and sweat paid off. But for some reason, one day in 1946, products stopped coming, and when crops started to wither and die, investigators decided to take a closer look. The farmhouse was abandoned, dust covered the floor, mold and dampness covered the rest. Fecal matter was found across the house, all but in one room. One room seemed to have been spared from whatever the rest of the house suffered from. It came with no other explanation than that someone must live there but no living soul was to be found. Instead, remains were discovered in the basement, both from Mr. and Mrs. Adams together with livestock. Several years later, as people were trying to renovate and hoped to sell the place, they discovered disturbing things inside the walls as they started to collapse. Things and creations put together by human hands. The whole farm was to be forgotten, but somehow people were drawn to it as things occurred. The silo toppled over during a storm, revealing corpses inside, and one night the harvester started, spewing blood all over the trees. Now Cauldron Farm was nothing more than that buzzing sound one can hear during summer nights. For the common eye, Auto Haven Wreckers was nothing more than a scrap heap with old cars. Maybe to some, an eyesore as people passed it on their way to work. But nobody really knew the secret it kept within. Nobody thought that the police would find hundreds of bodies, bits and pieces, some more rotten than others, crammed into cars. Human bones bent in unnatural ways. The stench that struck the police was unbearable, and the most horrific finding was the owner. Stuck in the crusher without a head, the few employees that could be found held no answers to the deeds that had taken place at the scrapyard. The place was condemned, and as it saw the town's reputation, people just let it be overgrown, maybe with naive hope for it to be consumed by nature itself. But as the townsfolk started to see how the lights turned on and off at night, and even could hear the crusher working, they suspected something more. But all they did was to speed up as they passed it on their way to their now somewhat safer lives. There is insanity and then there are minds that are so severely distorted that they cease being humans. Instead they end up a feral, living, unwanted thing. These people must be stored somewhere and that's where the Crotus Prem Asylum plays a crucial role. Established in 1857, Crotus Prem was originally a hospital but as the need of storage grew it was turned into an insane asylum. Crotus Prem is a place riddled with tall tales that aren't even close to the reality that takes place within its walls. It was never the biggest asylum but the one that held the most violent and warped minds the country had ever met. But it was not the residents that etched the name Crotus Pren into the history books, instead it was a mass suicide where over 50 patients were found dead in their beds. The building was abandoned shortly after that, investigators had no answers, and the townsfolk became more and more worried as rumours talked about a woman still living inside the asylum. Finally one night smoke rose from the woods as Crotus Pren had been set ablaze. The bystanders did nothing, they just let it burn. Haddonfield is a calm little town without much going on, or at least it was. If you were to ask anyone in the town, at the school or in a bar if there's something off of Haddonfield, they'd decline. To accept that this was the birthplace of one of the purest form of evil is hard. People living here have always felt safe and protected. There were no boogeymen or other shady characters in the night, no lurking, no skulking. People slept perfectly fine for decades knowing this for a fact. So when Halloween came about, the townsfolk were reluctant to accept that Haddonfield is now forever known as an evil place. Gossip and made up stories flooded the town. Nobody really knows what happened, or if it's safe nowadays. Some moved away, others visited as morbid tourists. During the day, a common visitor wouldn't suspect a thing. But as the sun sets and the night comes, an eerie quietness devours the town.
People are afraid, and as you visit Haddonfield, you too will get afraid. Not only because it sits upon a dark history, but also because something is off. This isn't a real place, but instead a warped version of a reality that is no more. An entity version, if you would like. It wasn't until the villagers of a nearby hamlet discovered a half-submerged collection of huts during a search for a missing person that the true history of Backwater Swamp began to unravel. After the federal authorities were alerted to the small settlement, they opted to drain the waters around the village in order to investigate the outcome of the previous inhabitants. Even after only a small amount of water had been removed, they soon realised that any poor souls that had drifted on the current or gotten lost wandering in the swamp had found their way to this place. Saturated bits of flesh floated in the remaining water, and Cake's blood darkened the already rotting wood of the shack amidst the occasional limb. In the middle of the encampment, a large paddle steamer engulfed by the sloppy, drawling mud loomed over its surroundings. Upon closer inspection, one could read the discrepant lettering across the port side reading the pale rose. Further drainage eventually gave access to the lower levels of the steamer. Even going near the entrance caused several investigators to vomit as a horrible stench oozed out into the open air. At the top of the stairs, several marks in the walls could be noted, hinting that something had been clawing at them. The marks continued almost in a line down the steps until the flooded basement hid them from sight. At the bottom, the true horror was found. An approximation of 37 confirmed sets of human remains floated and bobbed in the crimson water, veins and intestines flowing out of their respective cavities. Corpses showed traces of being cut into, the bones apparently carefully scraped free of flesh by either tools, claws or both. Only one body, Lander Millard, was ever identified and sufficiently recovered for a burial. Most deduced a cannibalistic individual likely hunted in the swamp, though this was never proven. Village rumour has it whoever was responsible fled in the darkest reaches of the swamp to one day begin their foul hunt again. As for the family that actually lurks in these waters, the villagers would stumble across them elsewhere devoured by an unidentifiable animal. Nestled in a sleepy woods three miles of Michaelstown, Illinois, the Leroy Memorial Institute started out life a hospital specialising in the rehabilitation of GIs returning from the Korean War. The mansion built late in the 1800s and its massive lot were donated by the previous owner to be transformed into a medical facility. As an army hospital, it always fell under different laws and rules to other hospitals and in 1967 it effectively became a front for the CIA. Under the stewardship of Mr. Stamper, the old army patients were shipped out and a huge fence erected around the property. Around this time, the public were refused access to the patients, and the whole place was shrouded in secrecy. By 1970, the institute was fully transformed into a CIA black site with special requirements to develop cutting-edge interrogation techniques, and they employed a wide range of different doctors and specialists to help them. The institute fried through the 70s, growing to a staff of hundreds, filling the main hospital and several outbuildings. Documents and evidence about the institute is scarce, as the government condemns the entire building in 1983, even raising most of the building to the ground in what seemed to be planned explosive demolition. Even now, the events that led to the closing of the institute and what happened to the staff and patients is shrouded in controversy and mystery. Snippets of information in heavily redacted documents tell the story of some kind of incident or event, but even the most tenacious of reporters have failed to unearth any real evidence of conspiracy or wrongdoing. You can still see the remains of the shell of the main hospital facility, standing defiant against the ruins that surround it on what is still US military land. But that's the end of this Dead by Daylight lore video. If you enjoyed it, then make sure you drop a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the other uploads on Dead by Daylight. I will see you all in the next one.